We are going to be joined by Mr. Ian Hazakostas, who has graciously given us his time to uh, have a chat and talk about all things to do with 9.1 and, of course, the Shadowlands overall. Uh, so let's hope we have a good interview. Hi, Ian. How are you doing? Hey, pretty good. Always That's... good to be here, Mike. Looking forward to another fun conversation. I'm so happy you called me Mike. Like, it's very awkward when people call me Rich. <laughs> It's very, very awkward. I mean, um, you didn't call me Watcher, so I'm just reciprocating, right? I've never called you Watcher, it. ever. Uh, I think I've got a I appreciate wrong that. a million times, that's for sure. Um, what I would say is we had over a thousand question suggestions for today. Like, people were super interested in what we could talk about. So I've done the best to try and appease as many people as possible. But as you said during our little pre-chat there, is pleasing everybody in World of Warcraft ain't an easy task. Yep, even winning is disappointing 99% of your audience. Enjoy. It is. It is. Uh, I did want to talk, first of all, like, 9.0 has been such a long time, like, comparative to other starter patches. But we did have Shadowlands delayed. Uh, 9.1, we don't have a release date yet. I just wanted you to talk to that to get us started uh, about any issues you guys have had with development or what's been happening over your side, just to fill us in a little bit there. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's no question that this is not the ideal release cadence for our content for our game you know i think we would we would prefer frankly to have I, I prefer to be sitting here right now talking to you announcing that you know chains of domination is coming out in just a couple weeks and you have a bunch of new raid content to jump into and a new zone to explore and all the rest but we've definitely been playing catch up a little bit um lots of challenges just adapting to remote work and dealing with the pandemic as a whole uh, you know, Shadowlands itself was a monumental effort last year, but that was also finishing a project that was already well underway. Mm -hmm. Chains of Domination represents the first thing that really will have been done from inception to completion entirely from our homes. That has its own unique set of challenges that we're still working through. Thank everybody for their patience. Um, we have an exciting slate of content planned after this, and you know, I think we're making great progress on that. So I know I, I've seen some of the you know, prognosticators and, and maybe even doomsayers wondering, like, is this going to be like Warlords? Is there just one tier? <laughs> no, we have, you know, there's going to be something epic and mind-blowing up next after this, um, and that's that's coming along great. Can't wait to talk about it more later in the year. Okay, so that's 9.2 stuff, I would imagine. Yes, exactly. Okay, okay. Well, I will say, I've been testing the 9.1 PTR every day uh, since it came out, uh, hoping and hoping for more and more stuff to see what's going on in 9.1. Uh, I did want to start off with Corthia because um, a vast array of people, including myself, a little disappointed with the world content in the base 9.0 Shadowlands, and Corthia is the new zone. The story you've done is incredible. Uh, I said this to Josh, actually, I think last week, is that the story stuff you've put into 9.1 is the best I've seen, and I'm not a story guy at all. The zone itself, though, is still really bare bones, uh, as it's supposed to be the City of Secrets. We haven't really seen any of that yet. We've just seen a basic daily quest hub. Can you talk a little bit on what this represents? Is it this, is this just the starter, or is there a lot to come, or is this kind of what we should expect? No, there's there's a lot more that's still in development that we'll be dropping onto PTR in the coming weeks. Um, we generally we, we want to get our PTR up as soon as we're ready to start getting useful feedback on something. And in this case, it's a lot of the story quests, some of the class changes, getting that raid testing loop spun up and working out the kinks there so we can you know be on track to get feedback on all the bosses. Uh, Corthia is going to have a number of other daily quests, rares, zone events, and just a general reward loop that's going to be added to it. Um, also, you know, playing off the City of Secrets vibe, some of those are going to be tied into, you know, on a, on a narrative side, learning some of the origins of both the Maw, but also the these mysterious progenitors that have been hinted at, the power behind Orvos, the power behind some of the areas that we're seeing in Corthia. Uh, and, and then rewards-wise, you know, I think we're looking to something like Mana Pearls from Najdatar as an inspiration, uh, minus some of the you know RNG benthic gear that ended up being best in slot for the there raid. Is, thank you. That's yeah. That's <laughs> we, we we could probably do without the endless fishing and rerolling for you know specific pieces, but we want to do a lot more to give outdoor world-oriented players, uh, you know, goals to work towards and really more robust gear progression than they've had in Shadowlands at the mm -hmm. outset. It felt like kind of covenant, covenant sets subsumed a lot of that space, and there's more that we can do there. So mm -hmm. what you're seeing is very much a work in progress, and look forward to seeing evolving Corthia feedback in the coming weeks. Oh, I am, absolutely. And I'm really interested in the gearing stuff. Um, 
I actually didn't put this down as things for us to talk about, but one thing that's got me super excited in 9.1 is obviously we've seen the Sylvanas bow, where you're adding new abilities uh, via weaponry, which has got me excited beyond all recognition. Is that the kind of thing we can expect, or are we expecting procs and things like that? I, I mean, every time you defeat a character of the stature of Sylvanas, perhaps. I mean, I think that that started out as we just we knew we needed to do something pretty special for Sylvanas itemization, and you know, her bow is is. You know, we actually considered, should this be a legendary? Should this be an artifact? Um, the initial version of it, I believe, was m modifying a specific ability in a way that was proving almost impossible to balance across specs, let alone covenants. And so part of the thought was like, let, hey, let's just make this its own thing. And we have the ability, going back to artifacts, to you know give you a new button when you equip an item. It's certainly not, it's not something we see ourselves doing routinely, okay. but it's, a, it's another fun space to explore where it makes sense with itemization. Yeah. Uh, hunters only then? Or... Oh, yes. Okay. All right. Sorry, guys. <laughs> uh, let's talk about Legos for a bit, or Legendaries, because um, we have this really... The, the actual system of creating them is kind of cool. Uh, you get to choose your own stats and things like that. Now we're going into the living, breathing uh, Shadowlands experience. This is obviously some issues being raised now, such as you, when you guys do these class changes, like you've just said, stats and things change on various characters, which means... With the current system, they would have to rebuild a brand new of the same exact legendary in order to accommodate changes that you guys make. Uh, certainly if you want to have the best ones, and if it's a craftable item, people do want to have their best ones. You did mention in an interview previously about refunding and stuff like that. Have you explored a bit more on that? Um, we explored, but no no specific plans for 9.1. Um, the way that obtaining, you know, the previously Mega Soul Ash, new Soul Cinders will work is that it just comes from layers 9 and up in mm -hmm. Torghast, uh, and, and that's going to be needed to upgrade your legendaries past 235, but given the way that Torghast works, of course, you're also getting the rewards from all the lower layers. So you'll still be getting significant amounts of Soul Ash, so you don't necessarily have to choose between upgrading your current legendaries or making new ones if that's the path that you want to take. Um, we, we definitely recognize that this is a pain point and are working on a longer-term solution there. You know, it's not just maybe it's not just wanting to change the stats on your legendary potentially, but also longer term if you crafted it for one equipment slot. But due to new gear that comes out from the new raid or elsewhere, you decide you want a different slot for your legendary. We want to make that easier to to switch, but we don't know that that's going to be doable for chains of domination in particular. But we are working on something. Okay. Uh, so I kind of have something similar because we're having the covenant specific legendaries coming in, uh, which I assume after what you just said, it will be just craft from fresh. Uh, do those things change when you swap covenants at all, or will it be if you change from night fade to venthyr, for example, you you would recraft the venthyr legendary? You'd recraft the venthyr legendary. Okay. Uh, any update on when we're probably going to get two? A lot of them are designed to be paired up. Is that like a nine point two things maybe? Because uh, obviously, when people have covenant ones, they would probably like that as well as their class one alongside it yep the, i mean i think that's that's certainly something that's on the table um not not planning on it for chains of domination but it's a, a space we're likely to explore mm -hmm. towards the end of the expansion that's so good uh okay this is the biggest sore spot i think from the uh raiders in the community is conduit energy i mean do i need to say anything more what's what's, <laughs> what's happening with conduit energy do you think I mean, everyone loves it. That's the feedback we've heard. So we're just, we just figure we'll, we'll proceed as we are. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I th and, and the feedback is we've heard is not just, not just from Raiders, also from, you know, I've heard this from hardcore arena folks, um, but particularly people who are active players playing in multiple types of content. Mm -hmm. And I, th I think our, our take on Conduit Energy right now is that it's, it's imperfect, for sure. Um, the part of the goal of the system as a whole is to... Situ is to situate your soulbind layout, your conduit placement across all of your soulbinds as a bit more of a, of a semi-rigid choice when it comes to you know, friction. You have things that you can swap back and forth all the time, like your talents or your spec, and you have things that are immutable like your class. These are somewhere in the middle. The thing we wanted to avoid was yet another system where the routine behavior for most players is as you're doing your farm clear of the raid, you're, you know, switching to AoE conduits for Council of Blood, then Hearthing swapping to single target for Sludge Fist, then back to AoE Cleave setup for Generals, and so forth. And that just becomes an extra layer of, frankly, inconvenience, nuisance, and undermines elements of choice inherent in the system. Now, the flip side of that is, if you feel like 
there's only one soul bind that is viable for you for multiple specs or multiple types of content and not, not just optimal but viable where you feel like you know what i'm not even going to bother queuing for arena unless i can have this soul bind with the, the conduits that i need in it active that's not something our system currently supports as well as it should um, right. something we're looking to do over the course of the PTR, and this is an area where feedback can help us a lot, is to focus on the soul binds, the specific soul binds that may feel mandatory for specific specs. You know, as we're expanding the soul bind system as a whole, adding new rows, adding new traits, gives us a chance to balance the system better without nerfing the ones that are currently good, but giving compelling reasons to use the others. Like, so if you're a druid and you can say, well, I use this soul bind for resto, this other one for balance, you're fine. You can just switch back and forth in the field. It all works. It's when you feel like everything has to go through one specific one that the system does kind of break down. Um, we want to see what we can do over the course of this PTR cycle to improve that situation, though other options like increasing the recharge rate of conduit energy are also on the table. Okay. I mean, it certainly feels... I, I understand the goal. The, the goal feels very clear-cut, but the... The effects I'm seeing on the player base is they feel punished um, for enjoying various aspects of their class um, because they do like to play, you know, high end or they like to swap around and they like to do different things. And although the system that you're describing does make sense, is we don't want you to feel the need to keep swapping all the time. So a lot of players do enjoy that, and the players that do enjoy those different aspects just feel unfairly attacked for doing for enjoying the game almost you know that's the kind of bitter taste that they they feel they're swallowing with systems like conduit energy and is that something that you think is reasonably fixable with the current setup or with your plans uh it, it's it's something we're trying to take into account like, like, like i said earlier i think we try to draw a distinction between viable and optimal and i know those are very subjective words that people you know for some people you know there's there is no difference and i think those are the people with whom we're always going to have some disagreement or there's going to be some gap between our perspectives. If you aren't willing to accept something that is 0.5% suboptimal um, in exchange for flexibility and branching out across multiple roles or whatever, that's, that's almost impossible to accommodate. Um, but when, you're, when we're talking about larger gaps where, like I said, you genuinely feel like you're not, you'd be letting your Mythic Plus group down, you'd be letting your Raid group down, you're not really able to perform at the expected level at all. Um, then, yeah, we, we agree. And we don't want to throw up barriers that prevent people from playing the game the way they mm -hmm. want. I think the, the, the challenge is where providing the people who, and, and I, I get it, there are plenty of people who are just sitting there being like, no, I, I don't mind at all. I would love to be able to optimize my character in every possible way for every encounter. Um, stop restricting me. It, it's, as we said at the outset, you know, World of Warcraft design in a lot of ways is trying to balance competing interests and play styles and often we end up making everybody a little bit unhappy but hopefully you know hopefully there are trade-offs there as opposed to just picking one side saying okay this is the way the game is going to be played and then everyone else has to deal with the consequences yeah yeah it does feel that way because uh, i know that certainly for ptr testing a lot of players including myself have just been copying over multiple characters to test different specs because conduit energy just runs out and all you want to do is try out yeah. the new things right yeah uh, that's all you try and it just feels like <laughs> You know, it's unnecessary, I think, is the impression I get from a lot of people. Yeah, there, there are also there are other quality of life things that, that we're looking at just to help with some pain points. Like if you're a, a new alt or you're switching to a new covenant, I think as you're unlocking things for the first time, we don't want that to feel like a limiting factor. So like as your renown goes up, we feel like we could be restoring your energy, for example, so that that's not a factor you're, you know, you're having to engage with on a regular basis. Really, the, the goal is simply to make you know this is to limit the ability to swap back and forth multiple times in a day right. and at, at, at the course of trying to do different things over the course of a week we want to accommodate that as much as possible and that's kind of the the space we're trying to navigate here okay uh <laughs> There's certainly a long ahead on that one, I think. Uh, for sure. For sure. Yeah, that's, we're never going to agree on everything, that's fine. Uh, I do want to come to Torghast then, because of course it's been nicknamed Torghast and stuff, but I personally am a huge supporter of Torghast. Like, the, the premise of it is fantastic. Um, we know from the data mining there's lots of changes you're making there. I would absolutely adore to know more about what's happening with Torghast and what you're doing, because it's the big replayable feature of the Shadowlands, right? Uh, what, what can we expect happening there? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think in this next PTR build, you should start to see a lot of those. So 
I actually, I mean, fundamentally, you know, I think you, you say Chorgast in passing. Mm. Um, I think there's something to that, frankly. It, it's one of the fundamental problems with Chorgast as the team sees it is that last fall, you know, we, we made a bunch of changes because the original iteration of Torgast was so binary when it came to success or failure that going through a full Torgast run, getting to floor six, and finding that you couldn't kill the last boss and walking away with nothing to show for it was something that was such a viscerally frustrating experience that it, it was you know just kind of a table flip moment for a wide range of players. Yeah. And the system at the same time was also incentivizing you like, no, you need to get your Soul Asher, you're falling behind, keep pushing to the highest floor layer that you can do, even if you're not quite geared for it. And across a wide range of the player base, people were just having a miserable time. And that led, because failure was so punishing, what we did in December was we just nerfed the crap out of Torghast mm -hmm. and brought things to a point where basically everyone wins. And that's what kind of a chore entails in some sense. It, it's when you set out knowing like, okay, I'm going to win. Um, I'm not really that engaged in the choices that I'm making. I'm not really focused on whether I'm playing particularly well or not. Maybe I'm trying to do it as fast as possible, but it's just a thing I need to do and an outcome is essentially assured. That, a lot was lost there. It's better than where we were previously for a bunch of players where they couldn't do it at all. Yeah. And we're just like, okay, I'm quitting the game over this. This is miserable. But we want something going forward that actually lets us make it more challenging without being as punishing. And that's the vision for Torghast going forward. So step one was getting rid of the death counter entirely. Um, where, you know, so there's no tower guru anymore. The tower guru is off in the Sanctum of Domination, soon yep. to be defeated by a ray group full of adventurers. Uh, and instead, to have more of a granular scoring system. Uh, when you go into a Torghast layer, when you go into layer nine, uh, you'll see some new UI elements. You'll see that you have, you know, a long term, a rating. There are these five gems or stars, whatever you want to call them, that measure your overall performance on your Torghast run. Um, there is a meter that is measuring your activity. It's kind of like, think of like being on a hot streak in a game like Guitar Hero or whatever, yeah. where if you're moving quickly, you're killing stuff, um, you're getting bonuses and racking up perks as you go. Uh, you want to balance, you know, are you avoiding death? Are you being efficient? Are you exploring the floors? And the more successful you are, the higher your overall rating for your run is going to be. You'll always get your Soul Ash at the end. But unlocking access to the next layer will require performance at a certain level. Uh, similar to Mythic Plus there, right? If you, if you think back and if you think to Mythic Plus and imagine like what Mythic Plus would look like if you leveled up your key, no matter how long it took you to clear the dungeon, that would have led to a place like what Torghast was at the start. Where you're talking about the people... degenerate play styles you were worried about. Right, where like, I mean, if you can imagine, it's like, okay, you're going to spend two hours slogging your way through meticulously, finishing, a, a, you know, an 18, and then, okay, time to spend two and a half hours doing the 19. There's value in, you know, having performance matter um, but always giving people an experience that's roughly suited to their skill level. You're never going to go into a Torghast run and feel like you leave with nothing. You always have your Soul Ash. And the other piece that we're adding is one of, our, you know, one of the most traditional elements of roguelike or roguelite games, which is a separate meta progression that is specific to Torghast, sort of a Torghast-specific talent tree. Yeah. Um, it, like in, visions for yeah, and players. exactly. In Nino at launch, some of those things were on Venari, tied, tied to Maw reputation and Maw gameplay. And there was a little bit of a disconnect there between your Torghast gameplay and you know what you were doing out in the world. Here, if you don't have the most successful Torghast run in the world, you're still going to walk away with some extra tower knowledge that you can spend to you know, unlock everything from power upgrades to convenience perks, like just being able to auto-loot auto things around you in the tower and more to help you on your next run. Okay. Um, what I'm hearing there, though, is, is have you made it essentially a speed run? Is that what we're looking at here? Is the defining no. factor is racing? No. So specifically, there are multiple ways of getting a... So our current plan is, uh, I'll call them gems, because that's what they look like. We're still working out the exact name. You know, your final rating is going to be from one gem to five gems. If you get mm -hmm. a four or higher, that unlocks the next layer. Um, there's some special achievements and bonuses and stuff for five. But you can attain a perfect five out of five score either by being thorough and clean and efficient or by going quickly. You can okay. choose how you want to play. 
So if you're exploring every level thoroughly, you're doing all the events, you're clearing everything out, and you're doing it at a moderate pace, that's a perfect score. Or if you want to do more of a speed run, cool. We, we want to let people you know, play into the strengths of their spec and their own personal play style preferences. I know the idea of speed run gameplay is something that you know, people have a very strong re negative mm -hmm. reaction to, and that's not what we want to turn Torghast into. But we also want to reward the people who want to play that way. Or, you know, if you're a demon hunter and you want to just rush through the whole thing, cool. Let's let you and reward that. Okay. I have a few questions off the back of that. Uh, it's Are we putting gear back in? Because originally in the alpha, we did have gear in Torghast. Uh, is that something we're likely to see come back? Because I know there's like experience and things perhaps coming in. Uh, not not currently planned on like standalone gear drops. Obviously, legendaries are acquired through there. And we feel like there's there are plenty of gear sources already competing against each other. And we like to make Torghast a complement to those gear sources rather than something that competes with them directly. Okay. Uh, I play a lot of the games that Torghast was based on, the roguelikes that you're discussing. Mm -hmm. um, and right now, it just doesn't have the same ability variety uh, to make the replayable experience, you know, something you want to yeah. do rather than I'm here because I need Soul Ash, uh, which I think it's like the Endless Corridors, for example, ended up being one run that you would probably do to get a mount, which we now know is not even useful in coming to 9.1. Uh, are we expanding that obviously so much feedback and i remember you guys sent us the email after the alpha that you, i think i did yes something like seventy five thousand tall gas runs were done in total something ridiculous people were enjoying the hell out of it uh just because it had you know new abilities and how crazy it got and you obviously pulled that back in are we going to re-explore that alternative routes extra additional difficulty things you can engage in anything along those lines that we do see in the normal roguelike world uh, I mean, I think certainly we're looking to, you know, add more powers. There are also extra, uh, more randomized modifiers to the runs uh, that you'll see when you get in there. Both some negative, you know, negative, kind of like Keystone Affixes, sort of, but also mm -hmm. perks uh, that are known as blessings. So we're looking to add more variability, more variety. You know, I think our focus in Shards of Domination, in, in Chains of Domination, though, was revamping the basic scoring system and progression. And then we want to build on this new foundation. We want to make sure the foundation is solid before it continues to evolve over the course of the rest of the expansion. Okay. Uh, I did want to mention briefly that uh, we don't really know exactly how these things work yet, but we know in the raid there's going to be a new type of gem slot, these shards of domination gems. Uh, some of the stuff has been data mined as being extra procs, and uh, rightfully so, a lot of the PvP community got in contact saying, is this similar to what we saw in Aldea, where there was like raid-specific stuff, or are these going to be new damaging uh, elements that are going to be active in mythic plus and pvp and if so are they, do those guys have access to something similar or is raid gear going to just be superior so um the the data mine shards of domination stuff is, is very work in progress that's not a final design i think you know there's a lot of if something isn't visible on ptr we're not talking about it it's they're often discarded ideas that still remain in our data files but we are looking at some form of unique bonuses and progression within those bonuses when it comes to Sanctum of Domination gear. Uh, we, we've talked about wanting to return to class sets, and we plan to do that in our, our next adventure after this one. But in the interim, there is, there is something to be said for making sure that for raiders, raid gear is a bit more special for the content that they're doing as compared to Mythic Plus gear or other places. So we're, we're looking at ways of adding bonuses to select pieces of gear that you earn from Sanctum of Domination and leveling up those bonuses by doing the raid itself and exclusively by doing the raid itself over the course of the tier. Now, these, some of these bonuses may only work in the raid. And the general goal is for them to be far more effective in the raid than outside. Mm -hmm. There may be some additional power that's added, but that's not terribly, in, in you know, game-wide, but that's not terribly different than unique you know, raid trinkets or procs on items or things that are slightly better. Uh, Mythic Plus has a bunch of really cool items in that space too. And with the PvP item level system for PvP, we feel confident that you know that the extra 13 eye levels that you get in PvP content from the Conquest gear will keep that gear the all-around best for that type of content. We're trying to get to a space where you know there's a wide variety of gear available at Endgame, but if you are a raider, you're primarily interested in the raid gear and complementing it with other sources. If you're a PvP or you're primarily interested in the PvP gear and complementing it with a couple of other sources. Um, and that's kind of how you're proceeding. Okay. Uh, I can't avoid this now. What do you mean by class sets, exactly? I mean, good I mean, old 
good old there's hey it's a raid zone there's a there's a rogue set there's a warrior set there's a mage set um thematic they carry art, any accordingly. bonuses i mean that's presumably part of sets i mean i, I think that's, we're, that's what yeah, i heard yeah. mm -hmm. <laughs> okay okay uh all right i'll take that uh i want to move on to some bigger topics with you while i've got you um sure so we had we i mean the last time we spoke we had some big conversations and obviously your time is limited but now we've seen the metrics on how the covenants played out um i would are you surprised by how players made their choice versus what you hoped would happen uh, and just what is the internal fe feeling now if you're going to go uh, further in this direction with people making these kinds of choices um or have you changed your mind based on what the player base actually did I mean, really, our goal is for everyone to be a Night Fae. So we think that things are proceeding wonderfully. And well, eventually, we'll achieve our goal of fairy dominance by the end of the expansion. Well, the Warlocks um, are there. 98% of them are Night Fae. <laughs> there, there's, there, there's, there's ongoing balance there. And 9-1 is also a chance to do some of that. Uh, overall, though, I would say we're, we're really happy with the Covenant system as an expression of Shadowlands, as an expression of the identity of Shadowlands, these four distinct realms, narrative paths, and you know, there, you know, as as much headache as it's caused, I know, to portions of the high end community, um, we've heard a wide range of feedback, uh, very positive feedback about the feeling, the choice, about the feeling of identification with the Covenant, particularly across alts. It's something that largely, you know, if I could go back in time a year, we would proceed down the same path. Now, that's in it. That's in no way to say that okay, this is a thing we're going to do in every expansion going forward. I don't think so. Uh, I think this is this type of four-way choice, the central element of this expansion is something that is of Shadowlands. I think what we will be looking to carry forward, as always, are things like branching narrative paths, the feeling like you know you can have your own personalized experience as distinct from you know some of the other players in the game, and you know ability choosing among different abilities, things like that, but in a different form. And not certainly not, you know, the way covenants were presented in particular. Okay, and how do you feel like, especially with nine point one story, which we played through, is it seems very much at odds with the covenant system as a whole. How are you guys sort of dealing with that internally? Is it just kind of a gloss over? I mean, we're all working so closely together now that uh, I don't want to belabor the point, but it doesn't seem to fit into the game at all at this point. Well, I mean, I think th there's still four. There's still different. They're different groups with different leaders and philosophies. They're working together. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the Covenants were never set up as enemies. The Covenants, I mean, other than, you know, the, the faction of the Necrolords who weren't really the, who you were joining. Um, and so we're, we're cooperating throughout. And there are still specific elements of the story that, you know, a Kyrian player will experience as they go through the chapters that occur in Bastion and otherwise. But this is, you know, these four paths converging as we take the fight to the Jailer. Um, but people's identity and where they're coming from where they're drawing their power from who their closest allies are those things still stand and that that is consistent with the system as we see it fair enough um i do want to talk about systems of borrowed power this is kind of a broader subject it is it was kind of a recent thing we brought in legion um and now at this point systems and the idea of the most of the class growth being borrowed power has become kind of a wow staple in the last couple of expansions it uh, definitely feels, that may, this is anecdotal for me, obviously, it's worn a bit thin, because we see a lot of things being taken away from us, like we saw with Legion mm -hmm. to BFA. Then it returns in some slightly altered form, so we know a lot of the legendaries in the game are just tier set bonuses that we used to have, or they're modified versions of Legion legendaries. And we seem to be going around in the circle of, here's some new stuff, we're going to take it away, later on we're going to give it you back, and how do you guys see this long term? Um, are we going to see next next expansion the convoke the spirits legendary for example um yeah i, mean, I think that there's certainly as we saw with you know the legion artifacts there are some things that end up feeling so iconic and so successful that people want to keep them in some form and we generally find ways to make that happen um on the topic on the topic broadly we agree uh this is something we talk about a ton internally when, it, when we look at our systems design and the direction we want to take for following expansions I think mm -hmm. looking back to where we end, how we ended up here in the first place was, honestly, I would say about 10 years ago, the development team came to the realization that permanent evergreen layered expansion of systems, character complexity, abilities, just wasn't infinitely sustainable. Um, that if you're giving people three new abilities every expansion, if you're adding 
new professions, you're adding permanent enhancements. Uh, at some point, the system kind of collapses upon itself. There's homogenization, there is you know just general ability bloat and complexity that is where things are being added because something has to be added, not because the game needs it. And so that led to us pulling significantly back from that, really from mists onwards. And what we saw on Warlords was the feeling of like, well, there's kind of nothing. Like there were Draenor perks that you got while leveling up, but I don't think those were tremendously exciting. And players well, didn't feel like Wolf. Come on. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, and 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 there just felt like a significant gap there. And so the idea was, okay, well, if we if we're not comfortable with permanent, you know, expansions and additions to players' characters, what if we do temporary ones? What if we pull out all the stops? And Legions was, I think the Legion system was probably the most successful of all of these for a couple of reasons. It was, it was certainly very fantasy forward, but also, frankly, people, it was new. Yeah, people was hadn't right? kind of, right, yeah, people hadn't understood where, where it was headed. People didn't get their Ashbringer and think to themselves, well, wait, what's going to happen three years from now? How, am I, like, how are they going to fix this? How are they going to move on from this? It was just, no, I'm getting all these cool powers. I am getting stronger, doing awesome things with my weapon, doing awesome things with my class hall. And then we saw at the end of Legion when we had to burn out your artifact because it like, was you know, literally more than doubling your power and adding a dozen different effects to your character that were not sustainable going forward to people who hadn't even played that expansion. That felt pretty crappy. And so I think looking forward, um, we want to find a middle ground. I think we, we want to, look, we're discussing ways of getting back to how we can still have that core RPG element of permanent advancement of your character, of I'm a mage and I went to the Shadowlands and I overcame these foes and I learned things and I came back as a better mage. Not, you know, I, I had this thing while I was there that I left behind that I never get to use again. Um, and we'll have, we'll have more to talk about how those philosophies express themselves you know, in, in the year to come. I think this is not a, a mid-expansion pivot, but we agree with a lot of the community feedback about you know, the risk of borrowed power just feeling like just, it's just a treadmill where you're, you, you want growth, you want forward movement, you don't want to get something and then lose it, then get something new that replaces it, then lose it. And we want to find a way out of that trap. Well, it feels like you're going in the opposite direction now, right? Because you're now bloated with borrowed power things. In the other, you know, in the in the same vein as like making all the legendaries, is there's so much stuff now of the three expansions that's been given and then taken away, is that now there's a, a huge array of things. Um, and there's certainly the problem we had coming into BFA when you started saying, okay, we'll put some of these into the talent trees. Is that yeah? But we had both of those uh, originally, so it mm -hmm. was a much better combo. Um, I want to talk about the fear you guys expressed. And I remember the discussion that you brought up earlier is that we can't just keep adding new talent rows endlessly. It's just not going to work. And you said you were fearful of how that would look. Would it be a blade storm that fills a raid by the end of it? You know, things like that. Are you still having that fear or is that something you're willing to relax on in order to add in these features long term? I think we have, I mean, I think it's the answer is both. It's, we absolutely have that fear, but we have to be willing to relax it a little bit and engage with that fear to, a, to some extent. You know, I, th I think the, the concern, and I, I can you know, speak to this firsthand, a, a dozen years ago, I was a class designer working on classes and trying to come up with, uh, you know, al along with doing counter design, trying to come up with, okay, what are the new Death Knight abilities going into Cataclysm? What are the new Rogue abilities going into Cataclysm? And a lot of the time, you had well-rounded classes that didn't have clear things they needed, but just there's an obligation that, okay, we're adding five new levels, 10 new levels. We need to give them three or four new abilities. And you don't, those are not necessarily the best design things. You end up with, okay, it's an extra cooldown. That's easy. Everyone's going to like it. Um, are you and responsible then maybe you're for Dark Sim? Uh, perhaps, perhaps. <laughs> um, that's, that's what I, a rare, case where, Great ability. <laughs> a, a rare case because when we're working as both a class designer and encounter designer, I could write a check for my other self to cash because that was a huge burden on encounter design. But yeah. hey, if I can sign up for it, no problem. Yeah, for um, sure. But yeah, and I think the risk is when we're adding stuff because we need to add stuff rather than we're adding stuff because we have a cool idea because it's going to make the class, it's going to make the experience more fun. 
it's going to give them some new way of engaging with group content or whatever else. And so that's the trap we want to avoid. Uh, but I, I don't think the answer is, let's do none of it. Let's give you no permanent additions to your character and have everything temporary. I think we need to find a middle ground where, you know, and, and we, we've always had borrowed power in some form. I mean, you would, we were talking about set oh, bonuses yeah. earlier. The gear and sets were like the original form of that, right? You have these extra things that modify your rotation, that modify the way your character plays. Then you leave them behind and you move on to the next tier and you get something new. Um, and it's, it's all about finding a balance. Yeah, for sure. I think we've gone very heavily in the other direction now, right? With mm -hmm. several systems all doing those things. Um, but it's, it's definitely something that we, we see more and more is like a, a recycling, which obviously feels bad from both sides. I'm sure you guys would like to be a bit more creative as well uh, with the stuff that you get to put out there for the, the players. A absolutely, yes. You know, yeah. and, and looking again, we'll, we'll, have, we'll have a lot more to share beyond Shadowlands. I think, though, getting back to it, I think we're happy with the Shadowlands ecosystem, the, the range of how those things interact with each other, the choices players have to make, the depth to the characters, we just want to find a way to carry that forward in, in, a, in a more permanent way and not have to you know, come up with a brand new system that people will go into in our next expansion, already beginning to ask and knowing that it's going to be temporary and that they're going to have to leave it behind. Okay. Um, when reviewing, like I said, we had over a thousand questions come in for this and a big chunk of that was about item levels and power gains and things like that. So I do want to address with you is that the power inflation currently in the Shadowlands is pretty extreme in a very tiny band of item levels. So what we've ended up with is a kind of strange situation where people are reaching, say, 200 item level. A Mythic Raider is just 20 item levels ahead, yet they're doing multiple times more damage, which is doing two things. is It's making people feel that this item level 200 gear that they're getting is absolute trash, worst thing ever. Um, and at the same time, we're seeing these raiders who are just and PVPers as well, who are just skyrocketing and makes them makes a lot of players feel like they just have no chance. Even though I'm so close, you know, numerically, I'm ten item levels behind or whatever. But the inflation this time around per item level has just gone nuts. Um, are you going? Is that going to be something that's addressed, or is this going to be something that by the end of the Shadowlands is just going to be extreme? Um, I actually, uh, so I'm, I'm actually interested by the premise of the question, and I, I disagree a little bit with that. Mm -hmm. And I think if players are looking at Mythic Raiders doing you know, multiple times their damage, frankly, that's a skill issue, right? That there are, as you, you yourself very well know, there are vast skill gaps there when it comes to performance. The, the power budget for our gear hasn't changed in years. Mm. One, one item level is roughly 1%. That's actually, that's what it was back in Wrath of the Lich King. Um, and Wrath of the Lich King, I don't know, heroic ice crown gear was 13 item levels higher than normal ice crown gear. Uh, if anything, uh, the, I would say the rate of inflation has shrunk slightly. We used to have 15 item level tiers last expansion. We're down to 13 this time. And while there is some additional complementary power increase through things like legendaries, conduits, unlocking extra soulbind traits, total power budget of those is smaller than certainly corruption, but even before corruption, like Essences plus Azerite, or your artifact weapon. Um, okay. So, uh, yeah, like if you, if you look at someone's stats, if you look at the gear, a 226 chest piece should have 26 to 30% more stamina and primary stat than a high level 200 chest piece. And that should be consistent across the rest of the gear. Yeah, I'm not sure that's what we're seeing happen even with skilled players going from, say, heroic to mythic. Is mm -hmm. it certainly, I mean, it could be, gut, again, it's a, a gut feeling looking at it and looking at the numbers. And there might be skill issues there with people playing alts or whatever. But it certainly feels when we're clearing raids that the item level bonus we're getting now is very extreme uh, in terms of the actual output that comes along with it. Um, I've certainly seen, just with those 20 levels, it's same player, same, mm -hmm. same class, nowhere near the potential there which is expected obviously going yep. from say normal mode to mythic but m larger than we would normally see uh but i will refer to your wisdom on that one for sure i mean I'm, I'm, I'm interested to dig into it <laughs> myself too but i mean i think the uh, that's certainly the intent uh and i, I believe that this i mean I'm, I'm not looking at the stats right in front of me as i say mm -hmm. that but i i but I, I believe that is accurate that amount of gear progression is generally healthy 
Like, it, it, I think certainly for people who are coming in as alts who just want to get immediately caught up, they don't want to feel far behind their mains, there's a natural desire to want to bridge that gap as quickly as possible. But as you acquire gear over the course of a tier, that's that same feeling that makes it so that, you know, a boss that where you once struggled to meet the enrage timer is something that you confidently steamroll coming back, you know, a month or so later as you moved on to the next challenge. And it lets us not have to make quite as many nerfs or make heavy handed nerfs to allow a wider range of skilled groups to progress through the content over the course of tier. Mm -hmm. Okay. I want to transition that slightly then and talk about that 200 iron level to the alt character experience. Because mm -hmm. obviously when we were, when, during the announcement, it was the alt friendly expansion. Um, now again, a little anecdotal, but it's certainly a view that's shared by many from what I can tell is there's this weird process of getting a character ready at cap. It, you know, getting everything in place, repeating the campaign you've already done is certainly if you're playing the same covenant again, recollecting conduits, legendary recipes, starting to go into Torghast again. And it mounts up into a, quite a daunting hill to climb over before you feel a character is quote unquote ready because you can jump into stuff, but you'll you'll be missing certain elements. And I know for me, it's been off putting. I, I've just capped 12 characters and I was looking which one I want to do and just the prospect of doing that without some, especially renown uh, is to the point where I, I didn't want to play them. I wonder if that's something shared with you guys about these sort of check boxes you have to deal with with fresh characters or if you're quite happy with how the catch-up system is working right now? Um, mixed feelings, I would say. I, mean, I think we're happy with how the catch-up for something like Renown is working, both for new players and alts. I think you know you can switch covenants, you can have a new 60 and just play normally and very rapidly go through the tiers that you know, obviously took people months to traverse initially. Um, that depending on... on which ones you're going for, you know, some legendary recipes. Obviously, it doesn't help if you have different classes, but the legendary recipes are account-wide. Mm -hmm. um, the, I think, so there are, there are areas where we can improve, for sure. You know, I think w when playing alts, part of the thinking was it's a, certainly a good excuse for many people to try out a different covenant. If you're playing through a different covenants campaign, it's a much fresher experience. If you're replaying the same full campaign that you've already done, that's understandably not something that a lot of people are going to be excited to do multiple times. Uh, Torghast and Solash acquisition as well are something that you know, does not scale as well as it should in terms mm. of multiplying across multiple characters. The thing we want to be wary of at the same time is uh, this always gets back to the, the, the dilemma of you know, trying to, to please different audiences with conflicting goals. You know, I think certainly you and many of the folks listening to this right now probably see alt gearing alt progression as a, a means to an end where the end is what they want. They want to yeah. queue high rated arena with their friends. They want to push high keys and they want to, you know, they want to level up a different healer or a different tank to run keys with their friends. They just want to get there as quickly as possible so that they can do the end activity. There are tons and tons of other folks who play alts because they've stalled on their progression on their main and they want goals to work towards and they want to you know, get their item level up, they want to earn new powers, earn new things, then when they get to that similar point where they have to go into you know, more organized content to continue progressing, they switch to a new character. And so if, if we're completely shortcutting that and removing the progression for alts at an account-wide level, we're actually potentially destroying a fairly significant play style for a different group of folks. And again, I, I know that many, a lot of people are probably listening to this and being like, He's out of touch and crazy. No one enjoys that. I promise you there are plenty of people who are all about the journey. And if we just said, no, there's no journey anymore, you just skip to the end, um, that would do them a significant disservice. And so that's what we're trying to juggle here. Yeah, I mean, I know, I know in terms of skips, the ones that I, I need to specifically mention because it was asked a million times, more skip for the start, um, obviously replaying the intro. Mm -hmm. And as you just said, if it's the same, an option to skip the Covenant campaign if you've already done it to get the Soul Binds unlocked. Uh, those are the kind of, uh, they're not long either. I, don't, and I mean, yeah. I don't want to come across as this is a, mad, a massive inconvenience. It's really not. It's just very tedious uh, and very uninteresting to replay that story. Because the stories are very good, but doing it yes, again no. and again, that's the problem. It, it I, I agree. That's something that I'll, I'll definitely take back to the team to discuss. Um, I mean, it's the same way we, we have the Threads of Fate mode that lets you open-endedly you know, get from 50 to 60 rather than playing through the exact same linear content again. We know that you know, 
narrative content is a centerpiece of the game, but playing through the exact same piece of narrative content multiple times is something we want to avoid forcing you to do. It should be an option if you want to, but not something you have to. Okay. Um, I want to move on to some nerdy questions now, uh, but it's, it's become more widespread, it's, of course, with the MDI being available and all the things people are seeing there. Uh, congratulations to Echo, by the way. And, uh, Healer DPS, because this has been going on for a few years now, is the discrepancy has become so large that genuinely, if you bring those high DPS healers, it's as, your raid is just so significantly easier because it's like you're bringing extra DPS characters as well. Uh, it's like you're playing with more than 20 men, you know? Uh, what is the situation internally with that? In terms of... I mean, more to the point, there's some... I know, I know several people who've quit because they're like Dresto Druids because they're just not able... They just feel like a waste of time compared to these other characters. Uh, yeah, this is definitely something something that we're discussing. Uh, solutions can be easier said than done without you know gutting specs or existing playstyles in the middle of in the middle of a tier or in the middle of an expansion. But I think both Holy Paladin and Disc Priest are obviously discussed a lot, and the, the, the big factor is healer. It's not just healer DPS; it's free healer DPS. Effectively, I think being able to yeah. trade off between damage done and throughput. Is interesting. We obviously want people to be able to solo as healers, do things like Torghast as healers if they want. Um, and in situations where there isn't significant HPS needed, doing damage is a way that you contribute, and that's a mark of a skilled player. I think the, the tricky part is when your optimal healing throughput also gives you a bunch of damage. Uh, Disc was designed around that, and the trick there on our end is, and we've been more or less successful at, at this at times, often less successful, dialing in disk throughput so that they are useful, often invaluable, but not all around the best without weaknesses. When they are topping healing meters and also contributing the damage they do, that's a big problem. You know, things like starting like reining in Spirit Shell and the rest of their of their kit is trying to move a little bit in that direction, both in 905 and 91, where a holy priest should give more overall throughput consistently um, but when you bring a disc priest well their absorbs can be like truly irreplaceable if they let mm -hmm. you survive mechanics that you otherwise wouldn't be able to and then of course their damage is their damage um, while still giving them enough throughput to be able to manage a dungeon or other content if they need to uh, holy paladin is a bit of a different case where i think they, they are a larger problem some of that is you know some some of it's ashen verdict stuff but i think it's also that a what one of many a play style that is one of many has become kind of the default and the highest throughput playstyle. Um, having the option to spend the fight in melee range, spending a third of your GCDs on like Crusader Strike and, and Judgment, that should be an option for a Holy Paladin. But the fact that it's the best way to play a Holy Paladin, I think is not ideal. And if you had to trade off healing throughput to do that damage, that would be a better space for the spec as a whole. And again, none of this is about you know, making holy bad or nerfing, you know, make, nerfing them as healers. It's having them make more of the same choices that other healers have to make when it comes to damage or healing, not just free damage as I'm healing. Yeah, it's just something I know has become a much bigger deal year on year. And there are certain mm -hmm. classes like playing Mistweaver, you can talent fully into doing melee healing, yet you feel you feel like you're doing ten times as much work as a holy paladin and getting absolutely nothing for it. Uh, while weaving in procs and things like that, and that's those guys just feel like, what's the point? You know, if I'm going to have to compete against this level of thing. Yeah, was... ag agreed. Right, and mm -hmm. I think we've seen it become more and more prominent because I think community sophistication continues to improve, and people, you know, value this more and more. Uh, you know, I think the mark of a good healer of, of other specs is weaving in damage when you have empty GCDs. Um, it's not just about your HPS; it's about what damage you can do, and so the couple of specs that excel in both regards are rightly you know, considered as such. It's something we need to make adjustments for. Okay. Um, another big concern that I had uh, from the Raider friends was obviously the effect of raid cooldowns, individual buffs. Uh, this this covers a lot of ground, Ian. This is from PI and certainly Anti-Magic mm -hmm. Zone. Um, especially from the melee, the melee friends out there who look at the very limited raid spots they get amongst all those specs. Yet, when something like AMZ is just as good as it is, two of those are taken instantly by DKs because they're just making the fight so much easier. 
And I know there's been some back and forth in previous interviews about we don't want to just give everybody a raid buff. We don't just want to do X and Y, but it's certainly causing frustration, I think is the word we're looking for. Um, I'm wondering what your internal thinking on this is. Uh, AMZ is too good. Uh, that's, oh no, uh, so sorry I mean, Death Knights. <laughs> so sorry. I mean, you know, you, you convinced me. I thought it was fine, but then you, sta you stated the case. AMC, so you said, rain. Mike, was it? <laughs> and, okay, problem solved. Nerf AMZ. No, I mean, I, I was. This is something we, again. We, we talk about a bunch. I think I was watching. Um, I think Max had a video recently on on raid comps and, and melee slots, and you know, he was also making the point of like, yeah, there's this finite number of melee slots, which separately we would like to increase, but that's more of an encounter design question. Um, and you're currently allocating half of them to DKs. Um, ha having a tool like AMZ is awesome. Having tools like Darkness and other things are awesome. I think AMZ is just bump, right. But something like that potentially, yes. Uh, and, and rogues, I, th I think, are lacking actually in raid utility. Agreed. Could use they rogues can definitely use something there. I think rogues have it covered in dungeons, but when it comes down to you know currently looking at your raid comp, there aren't enough reasons to say, oh no, we can't sit the rogue because blank. Like, what what is that blank? There needs to be something. Mm. Um, with, with, with with AMZ, it, it's just a question of magnitude. Honestly, in most situations, arguably, like AMZ is perhaps better than a major cooldown like Power Word Barrier, right? Most damage is magical, so 20% DR on a two-minute cooldown versus 25% on a three-minute cooldown. You probably take the former in a lot of cases, yes. and you can stack them easily. That's not great, right? We're, some, one of the things we're discussing, we want to make some changes here. One of the things we're discussing is actually bringing back, um, like AMZ, long time ago, used to have a, a total absorption cap. Yes. Kind of like a stronger version of Earth and Wall Totem. Um, I think there's, there's probably some version where it's still good. It's effectively not nerfed at all for dungeon use, or you know, you're dropping it on a flag in a battleground or whatever. But you're not getting quite the effectiveness that you are using it on Denathrius or Council in a you know 20 plus raid group. And we want it to be useful, but not quite the just amazing all-purpose solution that it is now. Yeah. The... I'm just so glad I do not have my chat open right now. I know I'm in for it. Um, <laughs> but I will ask about the Ferals as well. It's just uh, more of a personal thing. I absolutely adore playing Feral, but it's one of those specs that feels like it needs to be 20 to 30% ahead to even be considered these days as being in there. Um, it's, it's, it's such a hard thing. I don't envy your position here, Ian, by any means. It's like, do you just give something to everybody and call it, call it good? Or do you take things away? But with the melee specifically, it does feel like there's 10 specs for yeah. so many few spots. So maybe that's an overall thing with ranged being just more beneficial. That's really what it boils down to. I mean, yeah, the, the, we're, we're, one of the things we're hesitant to go back down the road of is spec-specific utility, where it's like this particular spec of a class brings a unique benefit that makes people feel like they need to respec or should, you know, Go, go as that thing. It's more about you know class level utility that we're trying to emphasize. And druids have tons of great utility. It's just that it feels like it's so often better provided by let's say your moonkin currently, and that's a little bit of a you know broader spec balance issue. But a lot of this just comes down to how many slots are seen as viable for melee in raids. Mm. I think it was, it was interesting. It, it's 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 an interesting discussion. Um, you know, it was going, getting back to that max video I mentioned earlier. He kind of took it as a given that, yeah, there's like five melee spots, right? You have 14 DPS, you basically have five melee and nine ranged. And then within that, this is the calculus. Like, we need to raise that number. And one of the questions that we're asking ourselves in discussion among, you know, the combat team and the encounter team is, how can we make it the right answer to bring seven, ideally eight melee? Um, right? If you have 14 DPS, mm -hmm. bring, bring seven and bring seven of each. Right? Why isn't that the starting point? And then you tweak it one way or the other. And in that world, it'd be much easier to justify a much more diverse raid composition. Right? I think that currently it feels like, oh, you can't possibly justify more than one rogue. But meanwhile, you have you know, three mages over there, or three warlocks, or three hunters, and you don't think anything of it. And so that's, that's the angle we're trying to tackle this from. But yeah. Just be having... wary of listing to Zoom as like Max, because... You know. I know, I know, I know. They're but, a bit all over the place, these youngins. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it, it's... At the, getting back to the general topic of utility, I think we're happy with the things... The, with what things like AMZ or 
death grip or stampeding roar or whatever ring to the raid. The strongest raid should be a diverse one with all classes represented. And we can create situations where you know those classes and specs get to shine, get to have their hero moments where you're building your strat around, okay, the priest is going to go over here and life grip the tank across the gap or whatever else. Like We want those tools to exist and be special. And so it's just a question of, again, as always, finding finding a middle ground and, and navigating the competing pressures from all sides. Okay. Uh, we've only got a couple of minutes, so I'm going to do a, a couple of questions that uh, people desperately wanted me to ask. How do you feel the AOE cap is working out overall in terms of the blows? Do you think it was a good idea or is there some room for maneuver there? Because it does feel pretty horrible if certainly even everybody from transmogers to high mythic pluses do feel kind of awkward with the the way the AOE cap is actually implemented. Yeah, I mean, it's definite room for, 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 for continued evolution there. I mean, certainly for, you know, legacy content farming and things like that that's not really not really the point um this, this wasn't a new design in many ways this was you know going back to how abilities like whirlwind and other things have traditionally worked mm -hmm. i think the way mythic plus the, the, there's a lot that we're talking about you know in terms of the, the dynamic of mythic plus in general certainly there's this feedback loop of uncapped aoe being so potentially strong if you can do giant pulls Therefore, the way to approach dungeons is to do giant pulls, but then also you can't survive face tanking those pulls. So now the way to do to tank is to kite everything. There's this kind of general feedback loop there. Um, we still hold to the goal of niches and wanting there to be people who excel at four target cleave, at two target cleave, people who excel at more traditional ten target AOE or whatever else. Uh, and I think. We, we have, we're moving in the right direction, but we have a lot of work still to do. And certainly a world where uncapped AOE is still king, but only a handful of people get it is yeah. not where we want to end up. No, the scaling gets pretty wacky on that. Uh, yeah. Very quickly. <laughs> very, very quickly. Um, one last question for you. What is World Quest 2.0? Because I, I, it's, I know it sounds very memey, but genuinely, I got very confused. Um, uh, I say I did all these alt characters recently, and I couldn't think of a single reason to go and do world quests or callings um and, and it, it was very off-putting they, they just seem to be longer is how it felt is that was that like something that didn't get explored fully in development and there's more to come there or is was the idea just for less but longer um not it's not really fewer so much as i think one of the biggest things that has to do with the place or lack thereof of world quests in the current endgame loop is the lack of artifact power i don't know that anyone is clamoring for the return of that but it always felt like Going back to Legion, that was the primary reason. Like in Legion, you needed world quests for artifact power from your emissary cache as well, and early on for legendaries and the chance at legendaries from your emissary. In BFA, it was pretty similar. If you were trying to get AP, you'd clear the map. Um, it's the, you know right now it's the best way to get anima, but that is a, pretty much an entirely optional system, and mm -hmm. some folks engage with it, some folks don't. Our goal with the changing world quests to add, I mean, to to make them longer, add multiple stages to some of them was actually to shift the ratio of doing content time to travel time. And okay. if, if, because it felt like by late BFA especially, world quests were like, I spend 85% of my time traveling from place to place, and like 15% of my time, okay, killing this one mob or rounding up these things and quickly clicking them and then moving on to the next space. Mm -hmm. And the, yeah, the goal was just, hey, more time not on your mount, using your class abilities, playing the game. But we agree that where we've landed, uh, the rewards loop is not one that is really terribly satisfying or rewarding for a ton of people. Uh, Nine one offers a chance to to change that to some extent going forward. Uh, but as we evaluate the role of world quests, you know, we want we want we want depth and variety, but also a reason for people to do them that isn't just an AP grind. Okay. Uh, if I could leave on a teaser, one of the best features I've had in World of Warcraft for a long time was the Mage Tower. And it gets brought up in every interview you have, mm -hmm. I'm sure. But 9.2, you mentioned there's some pretty huge things on the horizon there. Are we getting... Are, are we looking to that? Because I also remember, to clarify the scene, is I remember how miserably it was initially received. Because so many players just couldn't do the Mage Tower until the Tomb of Sargeras gear catch-up caught up. But then it became overwhelmingly popular. Is there anything that this is solo adventure solo challenge that people can plug away at work at something like that 
that isn't Torghast, which, like you said earlier, mm-hmm. is designed to be one. Is there something like that in the works? Not a repeat, obviously, but something like that. No- nothing exactly like the Mage Tower in the near term, but we share your love for it and the community's affection for it, and it's something that we, we want to find another place for. Some of it is also... It, it, the idea for the Mage Tower actually started from the rewards. Like, we had these artifact appearances that were incredible that we wanted to give out and wanted to come up with a way to give them out. And so yeah. we had, you know, hey, th- you get this one from doing organized raid content, you get this one from doing PvP. Um, what if we have one that's all about solo achievement and i think we need something that makes that like a you know a carrot is kind of a carrot you know carrot on a stick is kind of a you know a crappy phrase for it but it's like what's the thing that's so exciting that makes you want to persevere that makes you want to go through all of that learning all of that progression and make it feel worthwhile in the end and when we have something like that to give out i think a mage tower like system is pretty much at the top of our list for the kind of thing we would want to build. So it's more a case team. if you're looking for the report that you're looking for an appropriate reward rather exactly. than not building it. Okay, that's interesting. Would you welcome suggestions from all these people about something sure. that may be good? Yeah. I mean, I, and I see, yes, I, see, I see in chat, and some of it is also not necessarily global either. You know, I, I saw in chat some mentions of like Green Fire for Warlocks. Um, that was another great example, right? That turned into a, a solo challenge for people because we had something cool we wanted to give out and we built something around it uh that's something we, we want to continue to do and it may not be for everybody it might be for one class but it's more we can do that's superb i want to thank you for your time again Ian. it's always a pleasure yeah likewise always fun chatting as soon we should be able to actually you know see each other <laughs> IRL. I, can, I can't wait yeah i think like i still owe you a beer from the last time it should be Sounds good. like a plan. Hopefully, hopefully a real BlizzCon at some point in the, the not too. That would that would be good. Yeah, <laughs> BlizzCon line didn't quite have the same the same feeling to it. That's for sure. Uh, but thank you very much. Um, so nine point one is next month. Yes. What's the calendar right now? Nine point one is soon. TM. Honestly, it, 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 it's 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 when it's ready, right? We we know everybody is. We know everybody is. You know, has been very patient. Is very hungry for new content of all types. Want to get it out into your hands as quickly as possible. But it needs to be great. So oh, yeah, that's we'll get it there. Okay, excellent. Thank you very much, Ian. I will leave you there. And thank you to everybody who tuned in for the interview. Thank you very much. All right. Sounds good. Take care. Bye bye. All right. Oh, let me put myself over here for one second, team. Hopefully, I didn't let you down. Hey, thank you to Josh. I don't know if he's listening. Is he still there? Hello. Hi, Josh. Thank you very much for setting this up, my friend. Absolutely. I always appreciate it. I didn't put my foot in it, right? I just killed AMZ for DK. Is I in trouble? Um, I mean, at this rate, I just need to continue having interviews with you over and over and over again, and we'll just won't have any classes left after the interview. <laughs> I was, it was just an example, right? I mean, PI's still sticking around, so I didn't get everything done I wanted to do. Oh, God. I can't wait to see Twitter. I'm sure I have many pictures to look at. Uh, but thanks again, Josh. I really appreciate it. Yep. Right, Thanks again. Bye-bye. Bye. All right. Did, what did, uh, okay, let me get my chat back. Where are you? Okay. Did I screw up? <laughs> what did I do? Did I screw up? Oh, I'm sorry, Death Knights, man. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, dudes. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry, squad. I didn't expect it to be so immediate. Is it just... That was it? That was it? GG? 